Gather round me, you Americans, if you believe in right and wrong. The newspapers have ignored this, I'll tell it in a song. The papers and the TV never told a story straight. So listen now, I will to you the honest facts relate. Let me take you to a corner of this world that we call free. It's Monroe, North Carolina, where the Klan rules by decree. Now maybe you thought the Klan was dead and buried long ago. Well, in August 1961, you should have been in Old Monroe. It's a town of about 10,000. It could be a pretty place. But there's uncertainty and fear to be seen on many a face. A railroad slices through Monroe, it's not one town but two towns. On the right, Monroe is white, and on the left is Newtown. Eighteen Freedom Riders came in August 61, at the call of young Rob Williams to see what could be done. Robert Williams was a leader, a giant of a man. He said, let's protect our families from the violence of the Klan. Well, the Klansmen, they got busy. They came from everywhere, all armed with guns and pistols, and Chief Mooney didn't care. They staged a bloody riot, and the deck was surely stacked, cause the only ones arrested were the ones who were attacked. Now, listen for the frame-up. Did the Klan lay a plan to trap Williams and his friends and make him flee the land? A couple by name of Steagle were driving in a car. They drove right into Newtown. That was a bit too far. For Negroes live in Newtown, and on that fatal day, they'd set their lines of self-defense against the KKK. The Steagles, they were frightened, they stopped at Williams' door, and Robert Williams told the crowd to let the Steagles go. He said, come on inside my house, you'll get hurt if you stay here. And Williams led the Steagles inside his own house there. And though this man had saved them, police got on his trail. Nothing less than a kidnap charge, 20 years to life in jail. And then the mighty FBI joined in to help the Klan, with vicious posters tacked up in post offices through the land, saying Rob was armed and dangerous and schizophrenic too, as though to shoot him down on sight would be the safest thing to do. But Rob escaped to Canada and then to Mexico, and now he stays in Cuba where the FBI can't go. And now a make-believe trial comes in 1962. And we are wondering if in Monroe that justice can come through. Perhaps when it gets to the Supreme Court they'll get a better shake. But it's in the hearts of you and me the decision must be made. For we are all as guilty till we make that day to come. When Robert Williams can return to his Union County home. So listen, Mr. President, and listen, Brother Bob. If you defend the free world, here is a little job. If you don't believe the words I say, go see it for yourself. Go down and visit old Monroe, but be careful of your health. There's lots of good people in Monroe, but they are scared to say. Go down to old Monroe, Bob, tell them this is the USA. They say the German people the crimes of Hitler never knew. Well, let American people see what fascists here can do. For we've had enough of murder, we've had enough of lies. And the Ku Klux Klan in old Monroe is due to be surprised. For in Washington and round the world we're being asked today, is Monroe, North Carolina, in the good old USA? Monroe, Monroe, 
I hear those voices say Is Monroe, North Carolina In the good old USA The principle of self-defense is an American tradition that began at Lexington and Concord. Nowhere in the annals of history does the record show a people delivered from bondage by patience alone. Those are just a few words coming from native North Carolinian, a revolutionary who instilled pride in his people and fear in his enemies, Robert Franklin Williams. My name is Crystal Regan, I'm the Chief Education Officer at the North Carolina Museum of History. I want to welcome you to what will undoubtedly be an enlightening and informative seminar. This afternoon's program is entitled Rifles, Radio, and Resistance, Robert F. Williams and the Black Freedom Movement. It will be moderated by the amazing Christy Norris and will feature two esteemed panelists, Dr. Freddie Parker and Dr. Seth Koch. The North Carolina Museum of History is proud to be in partnership with Carolina K-12 Humanities on teaching hard history. Here at the museum, we appreciate the opportunity to serve all of you. We are working hard to create programming that entertains, educates, inspires, and speaks boldly to our intricate past. Stay tuned and visit us often for resources, educational tools, and virtual programming. Thank you and enjoy this session. Thank you, Crystal, and good evening to everyone joining us. I'm Christy Norris, the director of Carolina K-12 at UNC Chapel Hill, and we are so thrilled to have each of you with us this evening. It's a very challenging time for teachers now more than ever. We get that, so know that we appreciate you and we would not bring you together unless it was for a really, really good reason. And trust me when I say, talking about the incredible life of Robert Williams, as well as his partner, Mabel Williams, is going to be well worth your time, I promise. So a quick bit about Carolina K-12. We are a program of Carolina Public Humanities at UNC Chapel Hill, and we are adamant that teachers need and deserve time to think as scholars, to reflect as professional practitioners, and to really just have access to quality free materials. So we provide professional development and curriculum. Please go and check out our website at carolinak12.org where you can learn more. You can sign up for future programs. You can visit our database of hundreds of lessons. You can view past program recordings. It is a cornucopia of free stuff for you. And also note that in addition to receiving CEUs for attending live events like this one, you'll see there we also have virtual modules that you can complete um, that you can complete to earn CEUs. We know those requirements haven't stopped even if most in-person professional development has. So visit our site to check those modules out. Um, you can combine several for larger CEU increments and we hope that you'll find that helpful. Speaking of resources, my most excellent colleague, Paul Benici, is with us this evening behind the scenes. He's there in the chat box. If you need any assistance throughout tonight, you can communicate with he as well as all of your presenters through the chat box. Um, it only goes to us. You will also see that Paul's going to share lots of links and resources via the chat box throughout the program as things come up. And you can also post questions to the presenters using the Q&A feature there on your screen. Again, only the presenters will see it unless it's answered in writing. So know that we are paying attention to those and we will try to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can throughout our short time together tonight. As always, we will follow up with a list of curated resources and further readings based on the program tonight because sadly, you know, an hour and a half is just not nearly enough time to get into all of the amazing history um, and the life, the accomplishments of Robert Williams as well as his wife, Mabel. So 
Know that that will be sent to you. A recording of this program will be posted on our YouTube channel within a couple of days. We'll make sure you get that as well. So with that, on to our topic at hand tonight. I am so excited to spend this evening with Dr. Freddie Parker and Dr. Seth Koch, uh, and I'll introduce both of them in just a little bit to talk about Robert Williams. I on a personal level, I'm just captivated by his story and that of his incredible wife, Mabel, who was truly his partner in all things. You know, he is one of those visionary leaders who I certainly never learned about in school. And I find that to be an absolute tragedy. Um, unfortunately, it's not surprising in a state where we just went through a major controversy over the approval of social studies standards um, because they were encouraging a more comprehensive teaching of our shared history. So, you know, for those of you who are K-12 teachers joining us, you already know that the civil rights movement in our history books is sadly often taught as mythology. Um, often it is uh, just a comfortable story we like to tell ourselves and often left out is the tenacious resilience and agency of people like Robert and Mabel Williams who really formed the backbone of the black freedom struggle against white supremacy right here in North Carolina. Dr. Charles Payne notes that the failure to include attention to black defense and resistance in our teaching of Jim Crow and the civil rights movement has created basically what he calls a history more theatrical than instructive. And the fact is there is a long and extensive tradition of black self-defense, especially in the rural South, especially in places like North Carolina, such as you're going to see tonight in Union County, Monroe, where Robert Williams was born and lived for years. And so to teach students about he and Mabel and also the pervasive and common presence of self-defense and resistance among Black Americans, and how this was critical to the civil rights movement. As Emily Crosby noted, if you did the pre-reading that we shared, this is one way of breaking that mythology apart. And so if you've joined us for any programming in the past, you know that Carolina K-12 strongly promotes the need to teach a comprehensive history in our classrooms but in a way that empowers, that teaches the resistance of minoritized people, which has been present through every single period of history. Hard history does not have to be hopeless history. And so my hope tonight is that each of you will view and then teach about Robert and Mabel Williams through this exact lens and expose your students to these courageous North Carolinians who fought for their country even while their country fought against them. Complicate the sanitized narrative. Teach about Black self-defense, but make sure students understand self-defense is not the opposite of nonviolence. It's also not the equivalent of violence. For all the ridiculous and propagandized labels put on Rob Williams, um, militant, radical, dangerous, violent, he never killed anyone. I'm not even sure that he ever shot anyone. Now, he shot at folks, but they were mostly folks in white hoods um, who were trying to do him or his companions deadly and bodily harm. So his belief in self-defense was intricately related um, to the dangerous behavior of white supremacists. Rattlesnakes, he noted, were immune to moral appeals, as were white terrorists in the South. So remember that self-defense was also rooted in the failures of the legal system, both in North Carolina and beyond. The legal system was not protecting and not offering justice to African Americans. Police uh, often at best were complicit, turning a blind eye to the violence and cruelty inflicted on black folks and people of color. At worst, they were sometimes directly involved themselves. There was often no justice through the court system. And you'll hear about several cases tonight that were grossly handled in the courts, including the infamous North Carolina kissing case that wrongfully arrested a seven-year-old and nine-year-old, two young, innocent black boys 
who were arrested when a little white girl kissed them on the cheek. Robert Williams was beyond skilled at laying bare the hypocrisy of a system of Jim Crow that allowed things like this to happen. As a veteran himself, he noted, when Hitler's tyranny threatened the world, we didn't hear much about how immoral it was to meet violence with violence. But despite the pervasiveness of self-defense, despite the way that learning about it could really empower students of all races, it remains largely and um, just largely invisible in the history we teach. We, every single one of you watching, we have to change that. As Emily Crosby argued, self-defense gives students some concrete examples of the danger involved in pursuing freedom, of the dangers involved in not pursuing freedom, and of the ways that Blacks used not just moral persuasion, but pressure and power to achieve change. So before I introduce our first panelist, I want to just further ground us in the actual words of the strong and intelligent and fierce Mabel Williams, who, as I said, was a partner to Rob in all things. And while neither Robert or Mabel are with us any longer, unfortunately, I do wanna play just a brief two minute excerpt from her just uh, incredible interview with the Southern Oral History Program. She was interviewed by the wonderful scholar, David Soselski. And we will share this link to the full interview with you. Um, it's over two hours. It's really just amazing. You have to find time to listen to all of it. It really just blew me away. But in this small clip, Mabel Williams reflects on her husband's legacy. And it's a lovely way to transition us into thinking about who he was and how he is remembered and how he should be remembered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What what did it all mean, and and what was the struggle all about, and and the fact that you know people li like to blow up the fact that Robert was a violent man or That's believed right. in violence. Right. He makes a great poster. Yes. Right? You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? and I'm not against that. Right. Right. And that was a part of what happened. It wasn't that he was. He was not a nonviolent person. Well, no, he was a nonviolent person. He didn't believe in doing violence himself to others other than in defense of his own. And uh, I think that his stance on violence, violent self-defense, let me put it that way, I think his stance on violent self-defense did more for the civil rights movement than people want to believe. Because once those evil people out there found that they couldn't do violence and be immune to violence, then they didn't do as much violence as they did when they knew they were doing it with immunity and that nobody was going to uh, prosecute them. So I think that that part of Rob's stance in saying just this far and no further played a big role in letting not only the racist uh, bigots in the local area know that they had to make changes, but let the power structure know that they had to really move to do some protection or else the country would suffer for it and fall apart. Yeah, I think it affected the black community all over because at last it, it made them see that, well, no, we, should, we don't need to accept this just lying down and doing nothing. You know, we need to stand up, and when we stand up and 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 say no, uh, we make we have a greater impact. All right. So again, that was an interview with um, Mabel Williams by the wonderful historian David Soselski. 
from 1999. It's housed in UNC's Southern Oral History Program. Mabel Williams sadly passed away in 2014, but what a gift to still have her words. Um, you should know that our hot off the presses lesson plan um, that I'll ask Paul to drop into the chat for you there uh, uses in, um, excerpts from her interview throughout it. So you can actually expose your students to her powerful words. And like I said, Paul will post that in the chat box for you. But now I'm pleased to layer in two fabulous scholars this evening as we continue discussing the incredible life and work of Rob Williams, uh, starting with Dr. Seth Koch. Dr. Koch, he's an assistant professor of digital humanities at UNC Chapel Hill, and he's director of the Southern Oral History Program, who is the houser of that amazing um, interview with Mabel. He's also creator of A Red Record, which is a project exploring lynching victims throughout North Carolina and eventually the entire um, American South. The site includes lesson plans that Carolina K-12 uh, wrote to accompany it so that you can use that site in your classroom. Again, I'll ask uh, OnStar Support Paul to post those links in the chat for you there. Um, but what I'd like to do, Seth, is just start with you and ask you to just take you know, around 10 minutes or so to really just set the stage for us. Talk to us a little bit about what the realities were that Rob Williams was facing, um, the realities that influenced him to uh, be who he was, to you know, cause him to promote self-defense, and maybe just take us through a, through a few things that you think are important for us to know. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, thank you to Christy. Uh, thank you to Paul Benici for running things behind the scenes, to Crystal Regan for that introduction, and to the Museum of History. Um, for hosting me along with Carolina K-12. Um, I don't really know <laughs> what I can add beyond Christy's uh, wonderful introduction in the words of Mabel Williams herself. Um, I need also, of course, to acknowledge the work of Tim Tyson, uh, whose, whose work showed up in the slideshow. His book, Radio Free Dixie, um, is uh, the, the primary resource that I used initially, other than Robert F. 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 Williams's Negroes with Guns, uh, to learn about the life and work of, of Robert and Mabel. Um, and to understand the context, uh, it can be read as a history of North Carolina in the 1940s, 50s, uh, and beyond. Uh, so if you're a student of, the, of state history, as I know um, you are, uh, it's a great resource. Um, so Christy asked, and, and she just reiterated, um, if I could answer um, the question about context and the question about the, the, the context of the development of Robert Williams' philosophy uh, in segregated North Carolina. Uh, what were the realities of 1940s, 1950s, 1960s North Carolina that led Robert Williams to practice and promote armed self-defense? And why is this an important uh, but often ignored part of the long civil rights movement? And before I answer these questions, I want to acknowledge that uh, a lot of the people on this call, or most or even all of them, um, know this history better than I do and are involved in teaching it uh, day to day. So. Um, it's a privilege to share what I know and what I've learned from others, uh, but I'm also here to learn as well. Um, but something I do know a bit about, something that I can claim some expertise in, is the history of the death penalty in North Carolina. And this is the history I know, and this is the history I know that led me to Robert F. Williams. But of course not actually through his death. At his funeral, Rosa Park, who we all know, uh, famously eulogized this uh, self-described and certainly of other described militants. Uh, she so admired by saying it was a delight to attend the funeral of a movement activist who died in his bed. So I'll get to the death penalty, but let's answer Christie's question first to the extent that I can. So first, North Carolina in this period is at once a deeply white supremacist society, embracing through its politics the effort to repair the Confederacy after its collapse. And that society, I think, to many observers, could feel uh, monolithic segregated schools, segregated neighborhoods, segregated swimming pools, as we know from Robert F. Williams' experience in Monroe, white police forces, white elected representatives at the city level, at the regional level, at the state level. But second, that apparently monolithic white supremacy can feel very fragile because black people had been chipping away at it since even before Reconstruction, whether it was through uh, resistance and rebellion during the slave period or afterwards through military service, through activism, through creating institutions like churches and schools, through 
uh, creating businesses like uh, insurance companies, uh, creating societies like mutual aid societies to lift one another up in the absence of support from uh, white dominated towns and communities. Uh, we had the exponential growth of the NAACP in North Carolina at this time, multiplying chapters. We had the crusading activist, Lewis Austin, who published the Carolina Times in Durham, demanding government investment in black infrastructure and furiously opposing anti-black violence. And these demands that Lewis Austin is making of the state spark and attendant activism are sparking wild rumors in North Carolina. White supremacy tends to breed dishonesty. Rumors that black people are stacking, stocking up on ammunition to stage a revolution, something that white people here seem to do uh, after every election. Uh, rumors that black people are buying ice picks to raid white communities. And these rumors could well have been circulating in Robert Williams' hometown of Monroe, the kind of segregated Southern place where these rumors thrive, where the white sheriff, Jesse Helms's father, uh, the, the longtime uh, notorious senator from North Carolina, uh, the father who was known for his willingness to beat up black people. And indeed, as a boy, Robert Williams saw this happen with uh, the man known as Big Jesse dragging a black woman to jail with her dress up over her head. The combination of the strength of white supremacy and its inherent fragility, the need to lash out at perceived sites, flights, to wage war against people and institutions that threaten incandescent, all-encompassing whiteness, also means North Carolina is a hotbed of Klan activity. We are quite simply the place to be in the Klan in the 1940s and beyond. As David Cunningham explains in his book, Klansville USA, this is attributable in part because the KKK in North Carolina created an outlet for expressing anti-Black racism that didn't exist as easily in public in ways that it did elsewhere in the South. And as a side note, we see the Klan using the threat of communism and socialism explicitly as a way to fight back against claims of racial equality or even just simple desegregation. The very idea of equality in the mind of the white supremacist is a communist plot. And Robert Williams's life is deeply inscribed by contact with traditions of activism and with that white supremacist violence as well as with Southern traditions of family and community life and cooperation. His life and activism perfectly express the contradictions and complexities of the civil rights movement. A movement that relied on the traditions of the black church, but often received uneven support from that same church. One for which nonviolence was an essential core, but around which was the equally essential idea of armed resistance. One in which we remember the brave marchers, the boycotters, the kids who showed up to be the first black kid in their school. But we sometimes forget that this bravery did not exist in a vacuum. The marchers were being beaten and the boycotters were being fired and the kids were being spat on, not to mention the workers being evicted from their homes and their farms, the men and the boys being arrested and the women being assaulted. And of course, we hear rarely about the black soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines, the ones we occasionally celebrate for their heroism in Europe, while forgetting that, at least in Robert Williams's world, they were routinely beaten, harassed, unfairly disciplined, discriminated against, and otherwise abused. Before Robert Williams joins the military, he had an FBI file open on him. As early as the age of 16, he had joined the National Youth Administration, a job training program with a classmate named Benny Montgomery. Unhappy that his white peers were learning masonry while he and Benny and other black students were just being asked to dig stone, Williams and Montgomery led a strike and ended up not just with real training, but for Williams, that FBI file as a teenager. And it was this program that leads Williams to Detroit, where in 1943, he witnessed some of the most explosive racial violence of the era, with hundreds of black people killed there in one summer of uprisings that looked more like Tulsa or Elaine than Monroe but which echoed the violence that Robert Williams had seen and experienced at home here in North Carolina. This leads us back to the death penalty and to its companion lynching. Because back home in Monroe, violence was taking a very different form. Benny Montgomery, Robert Williams's classmate and peer in the job training program had come home from fighting in Europe to a job as a sharecropper. He seemed changed 
when he got back. It was reported that he had a metal plate in his head. He was not the same person he was when he left Monroe. He got in a squabble with his employer and ultimately the employer was killed. He was charged with murder and murder being a capital crime that was punishable by death in North Carolina uh, with a mandatory death sentence upon conviction. Benny Montgomery soon ended up on death row. So this was a time where not just the police, but the schools and not just public spaces, but the criminal justice system was starkly racist. Not only were black men, incarcerated black men, working on railroads, on roads, on farms and forests, mining, uh, cutting trees for turpentine and elsewhere after their arrest, but the death penalty targeted black men like Benny Montgomery. About 80% of people executed between the end of the Civil War and World War II were black men sentenced to death for murder, rape, and burglary convictions against white victims. And we know that the killing of a white employer, just like the killing of a white law enforcement officer or a white woman would be treated with deadly force. A murder conviction, as I said, carried a mandatory death sentence and sent Bunny Montgomery to death row where he waited until 1947 and he was executed in the gas chamber. But the story of Benny Montgomery did not end there. He was scheduled to have his body returned to the segregated black funeral home in Monroe and American flag draped over his casket to honor his service uh, in fighting the Nazis in World War II. And the local Klan, who were strong as they were in many places in North Carolina, announced that they would kill the black funeral home director if he did not remove the American flag from the casket. And they announced that though they were unable to lynch Benny Montgomery while he still lived, they would lynch his body after his death. This is when Robert Williams and his friends and allies and comrades organized, 40 of them all armed, some with weapons that they learned to use while fighting in World War II. They gather at the funeral home. And when the Klan arrives in their cars, they drive up, they see Robert Williams and his allies with their rifles and their shotguns, and they drive off. This was the kind of activism that led Monroe's white citizens to naively sign a petition requesting that Robert F. Williams leave town. That was one of the first incidents that really started us to understanding that we had to resist, remembered Robert Williams, and that the resistance could be effective if we resisted in groups and if we resisted with guns. But even as that resistance appeared to set him apart from the nonviolent direct action we see in textbooks, Robert F. Williams understood himself as being a central part of that very crusade. My only difference with Dr. King, he said, is that I believe in the flexibility of the freedom struggle. Why is this flexibility ignored? Well, I don't want to tell a bunch of teachers what they're ignoring in North Carolina classrooms. So I can just tell you what I felt to learn when I was a student in North Carolina public schools. Why was this ignored in my own education? My hypothesis is that because we want a persuasion vision of the movement when most white Americans were not in fact persuaded by it. It's because we want to pretend that despite the fact that white supremacists bombed churches to stop the movement, meek Christian petitioners were gifted with desegregated schools. It's because of the fact that despite the fact that police joined lynch mobs and killed activists, we want to pretend that nonviolent direct action alone changed the hearts of those in charge. This is because despite the fact that Martin Luther King was assassinated by a white supremacist sniper in 1968, who went on to give yearly interviews on the anniversary of the murder. We wanna pretend that King's dream of hand-holding children was realized when he shared it in 1963. And that's because Robert F. Williams and his fellow activists, including his wife, Mabel, insisted that even, quote, dangerous black people, whether armed with guns or with the vote or with education or with faith, have the right to live and thrive in the United States of America. After all, as he said, the only difference with Dr. King is that he believes in the flexibility of the freedom struggle and the sacrifices that Robert F. Williams made and that Mabel Williams made not only should be ignored, but returning to the words of Rosa Parks should go down in history and never be forgotten. Thank you very much and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Seth. Thank you so much. I think 
one of the things you touched on that I find so interesting and compelling is the fact that Robert Williams was a veteran um, and the the influence that that would have had, had, you know, to be in 1944, he's drafted into the military, fights for freedom overseas in a segregated army, um, but he also learns to use weapons well. So I, from what you're saying, we see that really impact him um, and the folks who were with him in Monroe, many of them were black veterans as well, correct? Yeah. Um, the other thing that I want to make sure that teachers know as you were talking about his influences an kind of interesting historical crossover here. I know that many of you teach um, about 1898, the Wilmington coup. And if you are not, please start teaching that. Paul um, will put some links in the chat box there for you. We've done programs on Wilmington. We have lesson plans on Wilmington. But interestingly, I read that Robert's grandfather, Sykes Williams, um, was enslaved in Union County, goes on to, after emancipation, become one of Union County's first Black school teachers. But he was also a Republican activist who traveled around the state uh, making speeches in support of the fusion movement. And when he, um, when he later passed away, Robert was actually given his grandfather's rifle by his grandmother. And that rifle was said to have been used against um, white insurrectionists at the turn of the century. So I think that's just in talking about those early influences, a really cool connection um, for those of you teaching about the Wilmington coup. But um, yeah, so Seth, again, thank you so much for that. Um, I think that there's so much there and I appreciate what you're saying to us as teachers. Um, you know, I was in North Carolina public schools as well and never learned about this man. And it's an absolute, as I said earlier, an absolute tragedy. We have to teach about him and really kind of resurrect his image because for children of all races, I think it's a really powerful story to learn about, to learn about the resistance um, in part of this movement. So yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Parker, as you know, if you join us is kind of, um, he's just a favorite, uh, a Carolina K-12 favorite. He is a professor emeritus of history at North Carolina Central University. He has a long CV of incredible work that I will not take you through right now, but it goes from African-American history to author, to historian, to television interviewee, to award-winning professor. And um, we're just really happy to have you here with us tonight. Dr. Parker, I know I feel like I'm asking you, I'm keeping you busy in your retirement, am I not? <laughs> oh, I'm enjoying it though. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to do the same as um, what Seth just did such a great job with, which is talk to us, you know, take the stage for just a little bit here and tell us in your mind, what makes Robert Williams such an important, yes, yet often really misunderstood and overlooked part of the Black freedom struggle? And what else, what events and circumstances and things do you feel that we all need to know about him? Okay, thank you, Christy. I'm uh, very happy to be here this uh, evening with uh, all of you who are assembled out there to learn something about uh, Robert Williams and the black struggle for freedom in uh, Monroe, North Carolina. Uh, I want to pretty much uh, read uh, to you this, this evening so that I'll stay on, on task. Uh, so let me start by saying that the story of Robert Williams and the black freedom struggle in Monroe, North Carolina is one that was played out in many parts of North Carolina during the 1950s and 1960s. In so many ways, the Williams story is similar to what happened in Henderson, North Carolina and Hillsborough, North Carolina. New Bern, Wilmington, and dozens of other small and intermediate towns and cities across the state of North Carolina. Efforts to desegregate an A&P grocery store, to desegregate and to ensure black employment in a Pope's five and dime store. The struggle to desegregate the schools in Kings Mountain, North Carolina to make real the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954. And yes, to even desegregate the pools in Durham, North Carolina, that is the swimming pools and other places are not different than the struggles of Robert Williams 
and the folks in Monroe, North Carolina. One difference, however, and a very significant one is that these other places did not have a Robert Williams, a man whom I believe was one of the true geniuses of the civil rights and black power movements of the 1950s and 1960s. A man who embodied the intellect, the common sense, the practical thought, the fortitude and the vision of so many men and women whose lives he had studied. And out of B. Wells, for example, a Carter Woodson, a Frederick Douglass, a W.E.B. Du Bois, and a Harriet Tubman. And yet, if one were to make a list of late 20th century Black leaders, the name Robert Williams probably would not be on that list. Williamson's uh, obscurity after 1970 or, or so came as a result of efforts by leaders in the Black community, uh, North Carolina and the federal governmental structures, uh, i.e. Governor Luther Hodges, the FBI and the CIA to vilify and to render his contributions insignificant. Williams's conviction that violence would be met with violence. His self-defense policy, where you protect your family and your community in the absence of law and order. When the system no longer works for a segment of the population, especially the courts, when legislation is passed to desegregate a segment of the population, then you use what you have to gain what you need. Unfortunately for Williams, this position led to his suspension as NAAC president in Monroe and the tag as a communist sympathizer and eventual flight to Canada, Cuba and China sealed his fate as an accepted black leader by both the black elite establishment and the white power structure. His debate with Dr. King and other civil rights leaders who were part of the Big Five, the NAACP, CORE, SNCC, the National Urban League, and SCLC helped to seal his fate as an acceptable Black leader. And there was a campaign to renounce Williams, uh, Williams' contribution to the Black freedom struggle. Though it is unmistakable First, the fact that he made a significant contribution to the Black experience. The fact that he increased membership of the NAACP in Union County, a tremendous feat within itself, and is a testimony to his organizing skills and his charisma as a whole. More importantly, I think, was the composition of that new membership. More women, veterans, farmers, and just working class folks. And his leadership in the kissing case is a classic example of how to handle such a situation. The case which came on the heels of the Emmett Till murder, lynching was part, was put in the national and international spotlight by Williams. You know the story, two black boys were arrested and sentenced to prison terms because an eight-year-old white girl kissed them on the cheek. Her parents went in search of the boys and threatened to lynch them and their parents. The boys were beaten while in jail. For days, they did not have access to the outside world. They were intimidated by the Klan. Their homes were riddled with bullets. Crosses were burned on their lawns. And after some intervention by Eleanor Roosevelt, who pressured President Eisenhower, who, president, who pressured Governor Hodges, the boys were released after three months. Their lives, though, were wrecked in so many ways. By this time, Williams and his comrades had desegregated the library and the swimming pool in Monroe. And it's interesting to look at, uh, listen to the words of, um, 
Robert Williams as he talked about their efforts to desegregate uh, the swimming pool there in Monroe. Uh, he says, specifically, we aroused the wrath of the Ku Klux Klan and a showdown developed over the integration of the swimming pool. The Ku Klux Klan swung into action. The swimming pool had been built with federal funds under the WPA system and was supported by municipal taxation. Yet Negroes, according to Williams, could not use this pool. Neither the federal government nor the local officials had provided any swimming facilities at all for Negroes. Over a period of years, several of our children had drowned while swimming in unsupervised swimming holes. When we lost another child in 1956, we started a drive to obtain swimming facilities for Negroes, especially for our children. First, we asked the city officials to build a pool in the Negro community. This would have been a segregated pool, but we asked for this because we were merely interested in safe facilities for the children. The city officials said that they couldn't comply with this request for it would be too expensive and they didn't have the money. Then in a compromise move, we asked that they set aside one or two days out of each week when the segregated pool would be reserved for Negro children. When we asked for this, they said that this too would be too expensive. The question was, why would it be too expensive, we asked. Because, they said, each time the colored people used the pool, they would have to drain the water and refill it. And that was expensive. They said they would eventually build us a pool when they got the funds. We asked them when we could expect it. Could it be one year? They said, no. We asked, would it be five years? They said, no. They couldn't uh, be sure. We asked, would it be 10 years? They said they couldn't be sure. We asked finally if we could expect it within 15 years, and they said that they couldn't give us a definite promise. In an interview, 10, in the quote, in an interview 10 years later, after returning to the United States, Williams said that he visited Monroe and found that the pool had actually closed. The Freedom Riders who came to Monroe in 1961 had a dual purpose, either to support Robert Williams and a number two, to show him that nonviolence as a strategy should be the order of the day. Williams was upset that the protesters, these outsiders, selected to protest on a Sunday because it meant that the Ku Klux Klan, those individuals were not working anywhere and had all the time in the world to intimidate, beat, and possibly kill the protesters. The protesters were indeed beaten and even arrested, including James Foreman, who supported Williams's self-defense stance. Not only were the protesters arrested, but hordes of KKK members and non-members indiscriminately beat Blacks throughout the Monroe community. The Maylie, a white couple somehow ended up in the Black community and lucky for them, Robert Williams saved them and carried them to his home for a couple of hours. Unfortunately for Williams and his family, it was alleged by authorities that he had kidnapped the couple. Wanted notices were issued for his arrest, and of course, he fled the country. I've often wondered what would have happened to Robert Williams had he remained in Monroe. Not so much about his plight, because we know that arrest, uh, trial was, was surely uh, in the cards for him. We knew that he indeed would be convicted. That legal lynching 
he referred to surely would have happened. Would he have gotten the respect? Would he have, uh, would he have assumed a position as a bona fide leader in the minds of a succeeding generation? Would he have been looked at as a martyr? Even while in exile, his voice and the voice of his wife, Mabel, were heard throughout the southeastern part of the United States. His Radio Free Dixie and his uh, publication Crusader touched thousands around the world. Many of his contemporaries appreciated his leadership abilities, his vision and his foresight. Malcolm X and others in the Muslim community, black intellectuals, college students, and the Black Panther Party related to his strategy of self-defense and even his Pan-Africanist leanings. But his departure from the United States in those early years made it easier for history to silence the real impact he had on both the civil rights and black power movements. By 1971, when I was a college student majoring in history, I am absolutely sad to say that the story of Robert Williams was not on the syllabus of my African-American history classes. It was not until the mid 1980s when I met Professor Marcellus Barksdale who had written on the life of Williams and others in the oral history program at Duke University that I became familiar with Robert Williams and the wonderful story of courage and fortitude by a community of men and women who fought for common decency and an end to racial discrimination and were about the business of using whatever it took to secure just that. Thank you and I will be glad to entertain any questions. Thank you, Dr. Parker, amazing as always. Um, I'll invite Seth to go ahead and come back on too. And while we wait on him to get in and get settled, I wanted to go back to the kissing case that you mentioned. Um, Juliana from Pender County asked, if there was ever any kind of movement um, to get a formal apology from the city, from the state, was anything ever issued to those young men whose lives were forever impacted by that just gross um, punishment that they received for nothing, basically? Do you know if anything ever took place? No, I've, I've actually read some recent uh, interviews uh, of uh, one of those individuals, one of the, the men, one of the little boys. And uh, that there was no attempt by the city, by the governor, by anyone to apologize. Of course, they received no compensation for the time they spent in jail. Um, as a matter of fact, when you look at those interviews, uh, it brings tears to your eyes because the, the individual's lives were so dramatically changed in a, neg in a negative way. Um, alcoholism, drug abuse, uh, one of them spent uh, uh, much of his time in and out of jail. Um, the people of, of Monroe and the state of North Carolina did nothing at all to deal with the uh, the ugliness that beset those two boys, you know, at that time. Mm. It's tragic. It was very tragic. We'll share with you. I ran across NPR has a few stories with StoryCorps, some interviews um, about the case. And, you know, the sister of one of the boys, James Thompson was his name, was interviewed. And I wrote that she'd said when he came back home, it was like seeing somebody different. You didn't even know him. Right. He never talked about what he went through there, but ever since then, his mind just hadn't been the same. You know, we recently yeah. did an incredible program with Dr. William Darity and um, Ms. Kristen Mullen on reparations. And maybe Paul can post that link in the chat for everybody, but you think about the concept of reparations and apply it to a situation like this. And it's just, um, it's just like you said, I don't even know that tragic is the right word. It's just despicable. Yeah. so. It was, it was, uh, I read those interviews as well. And um, 
the sister said that uh, when he came out of jail, you know, after three months, he was just in bad shape and, and never recovered from that experience. Mm. Joyce is asking a, a clever question. Do we know if anything happened to the white girl who did the kissing? You know, I've always wondered, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, Seth knows, but I, I didn't find anything uh, about her. Yeah, yeah. And, well, that tells you, I think that's part of the answer right there, isn't it? Um, the other thing I wanted to go back to that you mentioned is the swimming pool campaign of 1957. Um, really, you know, just an inc incredible campaign and such a ridiculous situation where, you know, um, in fact, that interview that we shared with you with Mabel Williams, part of it, she discusses, um, they weren't even asking, you know, they eventually were just like, can we just get a day? And as you mentioned, they wouldn't even do that. But um, I read that that campaign, while it was not successful in integrating the pool, that it was successful in some legislation related to the Klan. Is that correct? That um, I'm not um, familiar with the that. city council. Um, the city council basically pa ended up passing a, a ordinance that banned Klan motorcades or something. Oh yeah, and yeah. Is that right? Because they yeah. um, that you know shook the community when the Klan came and they got you know shot out with some disciplined veteran right. gunfire. But that was that occurred after the shooting um, after the the uh, vice president of the NAAC. P was attacked mm. by the Klan. And when they lined up uh, that night uh, ready for the Klan, then an ordinance was passed by the council saying that there would be no more motorcades because they, they realized uh, that, that Robert Williams and the folks now uh, were armed. Mm. And uh, you have parity here. And uh, they could, I mean, these guys were digging foxholes and. <laughs> And using their military uh, knowledge mm. to uh, to to combat the KKK. I guess they figured if we fought for democracy overseas, we might as well do it at home too. Exactly. Right? <laughs> no question about it. Yeah. So I want to um, pitch to both of you kind of a, a really broad question here. Allison from Gaston has asked very concisely a question that a lot of teachers have pitched. You both touched on it a little bit. I touched on it in the opening, but you know, what are the myths and inaccuracies that need to be corrected in this common narrative of how we traditionally teach the civil rights movement? And I know you've touched on this a little bit, but, you know, for instance, that there were alternatives to nonviolence, that that wasn't the whole story. Um, also, you know, the story of Robert Williams certainly does this, but um, what would you say about the role of firearms in the civil rights movement overall? I think you know that's certainly something that we're not teaching about, but what do we need to know about that overall in terms to kind of further break up this mythology, would you say? Because it's my understanding, I mean, even Dr. King's house, I think somebody joked and said it could be like an arsenal on some days, right? Um, so what would you say, you know, in general about the firearms and the movement and just, you know, in general, what we need to do to break up this mythology? I, I, I can I can get started maybe on the answer a little bit. And, and I think part of it, um, uh, part of it has to do with, um, I, I think, a, a very sort of white liberal vision of a particular kind of acceptable black protester who protests in a civil way. Um, that uh, produces a narrative of polite demands that I think many of us like to imagine we eventually acquiesce to when we change our minds. Um, and that's not, it's a comfortable narrative, but it's not what happens. Um, I think a lot of us learn, I certainly learned in high school, you know, you had a debate where one class, one side of the class lines up and they're Martin Luther King and the other side lines up and they're Malcolm X and it's an either exactly. or kind of proposition, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the most exciting parts of, of learning about Martin Luther, Martin Luther King's life and career is how much he was willing to change <laughs> and how much he, he uh, grew, like, well, grew sounds patronizing. I won't mean to sound that way, but how his beliefs evolved as he witnessed what was happening, not just in the United States, but around the world, um, and is calling for radical reorganization of uh, American behavior uh, here and, and abroad. Um, so I think that, um, in majority white classrooms, for sure, it really accords with our sense of a sort of false sense of self and who we are um, as white learners, for example. Um, when we imagine ourselves listening to King's speech with our contemporary ears in mind 
and not hearing his speech in the context that a lot of um, white observers might have been listening to it in the 1960s when he had something like a 35% approval rating among um, uh, white people polled by Gallup. So, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, what we could call revisionist history going on. And I think if we learn about the histories of civil rights marches, we learn that they received support from a lot of different sources. Some of that support were, was uh, people making sandwiches for them because you got to feed the movement. We don't see that as much anymore, but they had sandwiches in the backs of cars and sometimes they had rifles in the backs of cars as well. And we've got oral histories at the Southern Oral History Program, you know, where people shut off the recorder because they're concerned about a statute of limitations on transporting firearms over state lines as part of the civil rights march, for example. Um, and the group, uh, at least partially inspired by Robert Williams, the Deacons for Defense and Justice that started in Bogalusa, Louisiana and spread throughout the South, um, these are uh, rural black southerners, many of whom, as, as Christy said, you know, if you're, you're going to train people to fight for freedom in Europe, um, be careful what happens when they come back. <laughs> um, uh, and these are people who were using their military knowledge um, and their knowledge of firearms to defend their neighborhoods against marauding groups of Klansmen and others. Yeah, I think it, it, it uh, when you look at it from a historical uh, perspective, it runs deep, it runs 200 years. It, it runs back to uh, the journalism of the 18th century, the 19th century, efforts by uh, the legislature, by whites in general, to minimize the effectiveness of, um, of, of so-called violence. Uh, we, we had to make it seem as though, at least whites had to make it seem as though blacks indeed were mild, that they were nice, that they were good people, that uh, even during slavery times, they didn't resist. Uh, the, the narrative uh, in, in the late 19th century uh, is, is that they in, indeed loved being slaves, that uh, they were content as slaves. They didn't run away. They were not violent individuals. And so that, that transfers into the 20th century when there are these efforts to minimize the use of arms by black folks in general. And so I think as we come into the thirties and the forties and fifties, the narrative is, is even stronger mm -hmm. that violence, uh, that, that black folks have not protected themselves. They have not used um, violent means to resist the ugliness of racism and discrimination. Mm. And, and I think that the narrative became even stronger in the 1950s and 60s and to the 70s. Yeah, you just answered, um, Holly from Guilford was wondering whether this approach was more an exception or more of the rule um, in terms of civil rights organizing. And from what it sounds like, you know, self-defense, even armed, you know, an armed resistance was quite common, especially in the rural South, correct? That it was... Um, not exceptional. It was fairly pervasive because it meant survival. Yeah, everybody in my community had a shotgun and a <laughs> rifle. Uh, I mean, people were not afraid mm. uh, in my community. Uh, it was many times it was the other way around. I mean, segregation, don't get me wrong, man, segregation was the order of the day. Uh, racial discrimination was the order of the day. But we didn't have these examples of black folks being beaten down in the streets. We didn't have the kind of uh, ugliness that sometimes has been portrayed. Uh, whites were afraid. I mean, for example, during slavery times, it is well known that, that whites lived in constant fear of, of an uprising. But you don't put that in the newspaper that I'm afraid that my slaves are going to rebel because that would actually absolutely undermine the institution of slavery. You have to, you, you have to uh, write a narrative that, that indeed they are Sambos. Uh, you know, when you look at the, uh, the runaway slave advertisements, uh, before I looked at one slave, uh, runaway slave advertisement, you know, you, one would believe that indeed slaves were content, that they didn't uh, resist in any way. But when you look at the advertisements and the terms that are used by the uh, subscribers or those individuals who are writing these ads, it tells a different story about those men and women. They were, they were not with their head hung down all the time. They were not these Sambo characters that, that they wanted people to believe they were. They were writing these images of, of a people 
whom they believe or they wanted to be like that, but uh, that was not always the case. Right. I ran across in my reading, um, somebody was talking about a black sharecropper in Alabama was said to have told Stokely Carmichael, if you turn the other cheek, you'll get handed half of what you're sitting on. So this idea that, you know, that, that this nonviolent stuff, is not going to cut it down here. So um, I would like to turn to, we have teachers ask the best questions. So there's so many questions and I'm already panicked and upset about the fact that I don't know if we'll get to them all. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the NAACP. And, you know, you've mentioned that um, he, you know, Robert Williams returns to Monroe, he joins the NAACP, and it doesn't take him long to become the president of the chapter. He recruits his, you know, his biggest recruits were veterans and black women. Um, but given the realities of the time, you know, the reality Seth, that you were talking about, the NAACP membership is actually pretty risky, right? That you, um, you know, you could risk anything from unemployment to, um, you know, attacks from the Klan. Would you say that that, you know, just being in that position really kind of made him a target as well as the work that he was doing with the NAACP? Um, well, I hope Dr. Parker will speak to this as well, but I'll just say that, um, you know, people in Southern communities, Black people in Southern communities um, certainly saw the NAACP as a place where they could seek redress for specific and general harm. And even seeking that redress, whether or not you were a member of the NAACP would make you a target, a potential target of white violence. And so we see in, in collected NAACP papers, they have them at Duke, and I'm sure a lot of them are online, um, black residents of small Southern towns here in North Carolina and elsewhere writing to Thurgood Marshall, writing to the New York offices or other offices of the national NAACP asking for help, but also uh, writing anonymously or requesting anonymity, um, asking that a return letter be sent to a PO box or another address that they could safely collect it at without being observed. Um, and so I think that threat was, was absolutely very real. We know too, um, if I'm recalling correctly, that there was a little discomfort, uh, despite the fact that as Dr. Parker was saying, uh, Robert F. Williams' activism is embraced by much of the activist community. There's a little bit of discomfort on the part of organizations like the NAACP that are concerned about associating their style of winning legal victories in the courts with Robert F. Williams' uh, more assertive style, shall we say, um, of winning victories against uh, bodily harm. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to ask um, Paul to queue up. I just want to share a, another quick two, it's a two and a half minute excerpt from my new Shiro, Mabel Williams. Um, this is an excerpt where Mabel is talking about the NAACP's formation of a rifle club, um, which was actually officially, you know, affiliated and, you know, checked by the NRA. So I'm going to ask Paul to play that for us really quick because I think it gets at this as well. And, uh, all that kind of stuff. So um, Daddy John, who was Rob's father, always kept a 12-gauge shotgun in his house at the door. And um, I remember he didn't always keep it at the door. He kept it. He had one, and he kept it in his room, in his closet. But I remember one day when he pulled that 12-gauge shotgun out and said, we're going to keep this at the front door because if the bastards come over here after us, we are going to we may have to use it. And the claim, was, the, the, the claim was fairly strong in my mind. Oh, yeah. Clan was very strong. Clan was having rallies all over. Catfish Cole was oh, yeah. on the rise. Catfish Cole was all oh, he was. He was having all kinds of rallies around Monroe. Uh, one rally they reported that they had 5,000 people out at the rally, and Rob and Dr. Perry and a few of the other fellows went out to some of those Klan rallies and uh, were there and <laughs> on the scene. And it, uh, I think it kind of unnerved the Klan people when they did. Um, but um, that was what kind of brought on the um, right, rifle club. We organized a rifle club and got a charter through the American Rifle Association. And what did the rifle 
rifle club too? We practice shooting. We were all members. I was a member as well. We taught the kids how to shoot. We'd, uh, we got our charter. We'd have our little meetings. And that was the backbone of our defense group. And it was like a, that, an NRA type? That, that, it that, that was that, affiliated. Was it was a branch of the National Rifle that Association. Was the white people. Uh, I'm sure when we joined and, and the years after then, had they known we were a black group, they would have revoked our charter. I think they would have too. I'm sure they would have. But in the later years, when they were under such attack for guns, uh, they came up with the fact that uh, they were proud of the fact, well, if it hadn't been for guns in North Carolina, that man would have been dead, you know. That's great. <laughs> if he hadn't been affiliated with the right. rifle. So that's great. <laughs> and that's true. But the ironic part that I want people to know is that although we had an association with guns, we knew how to use guns, uh, we trained other people how to use guns, our children included, we never had the occasion to have to shoot anybody. And that is, you know, that's remarkable it because is. a lot of people um, when they think about having guns, they think about killing folks. And Robert always, uh, he was the ultimate teacher, always. And he always taught the other people and us that a gun is a weapon that can do terrible damage to people. And the only reason you would ever pick up a gun to is for self-defense and not for anything aggressive or not to scare off anybody and uh, not to play with anybody, but it was a serious business when you really had to pick up a gun. Wow, that really sounds radical, doesn't it? You know, like it's kind of common sense. And actually Jeanette from Gaston is asking, how could others not see that defending yourself was a right under the U.S. Constitution. You know, the, the right to bear arms, this seems very common sense, but um, I think that we unfortunately know the answer to that. The fear here, if I, I mean, it was really about the idea of black folks having guns and defending themselves. Well, I agree hundred percent. I mean, it depends on who has the guns. Right. And, and uh, the, the example uh, earlier when uh, the council said uh, the KKK could no longer have these motorcades, uh, the reason for that was because other people had guns now. Mm. And um, there's a possibility that we could be wiped out by these crazy people. <laughs> get what's coming to us, right? <laughs> get get back what you give. Um, we have a few people asking, I want to talk a little bit, um, if you can, either of you about the Monroe sit-ins. Um, so, you know, I 1960, March of 1960, this is, of course, after for our teachers, the February 1 sit-ins. Um, of course, we've got a lesson for that. I'll ask Paul to post that in the chats. But um, the story of Gamble's, the Gamble's drugstore, Robert Williams leads or goes with the youth to sit in at the drugstore. He's the only person arrested. Um, and I read that he then spoofed himself the dangerous stool sitter bandit. I feel like his personality is just fabulous. He has got this sharp sense of wit that just lays hypocrisy bare in, in just a few words, which I really appreciate. Um, but he made it a point to note that um, nobody got spit on or had a milkshake poured on their head in Monroe. Why do you think that that, I mean, it's probably perhaps an obvious answer, but that's actually a pretty big deal. If we look at the traditional images that we see of the civil rights movement and just wretched behavior that we see people enduring, that didn't happen in Monroe. Why do you think that that was? I mean, you know, we like to think that it's because, it's because there had been a reputation developed that this is someone that you wouldn't pour a milkshake on. Um, and, you know, there's, as 
Dr. Parker has said there's a certain power uh, to making a, a powerful claim to um, to armed resistance, but I, I am not knowledgeable enough about the particular circumstances. We know that Robert F. Williams walked around Monroe armed with a, mm -hmm. uh, a right with a gun on his hip, and so we know that he was telling people as he moved through public spaces that he was prepared to defend himself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't speak to whether or not he was um, whether whether he was bringing together the traditions of nonviolent direct action and armed self resistance, you know, in those particular settings. Yeah. By 1960, uh, the people in Monroe knew his reputation. Mm. And uh, I think he brought uh, a, a different vibe to the, the experience itself. Um, he, he said that our sit-ins are, are quite different than the sit-ins conducted by Dr. King. Mm. We, we do it differently. We're not just going to sit there and allow you to beat us down. We're not even going to sit there for a long period of time. We're going to, it's going to be like guerrilla warfare. Uh, it's going to be in and out. It's going to be attack and move back. And, and that's the kind of strategy that he used. I, I think his reputation over a four, three or four year period kind of dictated the terms and folks knew. I mean, even though uh, the Klan continued to do what they, they did, they were reserved to some respect. Mm. Right, right. So um, let's go fast forward a little bit because I feel like kind of the, a lot of the culmination of this story is in August 1961 when the Freedom Riders come to Monroe. Um, because this is basically what ends up with him being wanted by the FBI on a charge of, I think it was something like 20 years to life for kidnapping. Um, so, you know, I, I read that um, Rob Williams at some point said I, he welcomed them, but he saw this as an opportunity to show that what King and them were preaching was bullshit. <laughs> he was he kind of just puts it out there how he feels about it. Um, so as you mentioned, you know, we get these trumped up charges of kidnapping. But Timothy from California actually is asking, how was it that Robert Williams was able to return back to the U.S.? Um, did he and his family face any difficulties in their years abroad? Um, you know, and again, was there ever, I think we know the answer to this now, but was there ever any kind of apology or reparation issued for, you know, that kind of um, basically false charge that led him to have to exile? Being in the midst of the Cold War made that possible. Uh, I think the United States uh, perhaps believed that um, State Department believed that Robert Williams knew more than he actually knew. I think his association with uh, Mel Se Tong and, and, uh, and others uh, led the State Department to believe that uh, they could get information from him and that, that essentially getting that information led to uh, dismissal of, of charges and, um, you know, access to uh, the United States. Mm. Yeah. I want to try to get some, we've got so many good, good questions. Patrick is asking, um, while abroad or upon his return, did Mr. Williams have any correspondence with the Black Panthers, either in North Carolina or elsewhere? We had several questions about that as well in the pre-questions, you know, do you, did what type of influence did he have on the later Black Panther Party and Black Power movement, would you guys say? Well, we know that um, that Negroes with Guns, which, which he wrote with Mabel Williams, was hugely influential, particularly on Huey P. Newton, you know, one of the founders of the Black Panther Party. Uh, we certainly know that armed uh, self-resistance, armed resistance was hugely important to the Black Panthers and part of the story of the resurgence of gun control in the United States uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So, um, the, you know, tens of thousands of copies of Negroes with Guns being uh, printed and circulated undoubtedly uh, had a huge influence. Mm. And what about, um, we also are asking, uh, teachers asking to know a little bit more about Radio Free Dixie. What, um, because, you know, even though Robert Williams exiles, once he gets to Cuba, he is by no means silent. <laughs> um, he remains quite vocal with this program. Uh, could you speak to that? What, um, what was that program all about? What was he um, up to in addition to publishing his book from Cuba? 
I mean, it, it was a continuation of his messages, uh, messages that he had begun preaching in the 19, early 19, late 1940s into the 1950s and surely into the 60s. And I, I think that um, it, you can see Williams evolving. I, I, I do believe that, you know, in the 1950s, he had a kind of social consciousness that was communal in nature, that he, he understood that uh, capitalism as very core was a bad system. And uh, to seek refuge in socialist and communist uh, nations means that he did have an understanding and must have had an early understanding. I don't think that he was hit in the head immediately in 1960 and 1961 with this kind of uh, socialist uh, 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 leaning, uh, that Pan-Africanist leaning, that socialist leaning. Uh, he actually propagated the, in, in, in his messages from, uh, from Cuba, you know, essentially uh, that we needed to bring down the walls of segregation but not only do you bring down the walls of segregation, but underpinning segregation was a capitalist order that needed to be dealt with in some way. Mm. And so he is, he's absolutely broadcasting, you know, I see him broadcasting three things. Number one, you know, what people can see immediately, and that is the walls of segregation, and that we need to bring those walls of segregation down. But underpinning uh, segregation is a bad order and a bad order that has been in place in this nation for more than 200 years. We call it capitalism. So he's about the business of trying to, to, to deal with it, uh, deal with capitalism. And I think that he is trying to get people to understand that indeed black people in America do not live in a silo, that they have black brothers and sisters in Cuba and in uh, uh, Brazil and in Africa and in Europe and other parts of the world. And so there must be this effort to pull that, that, uh, that blackness together to deal with the problems facing because it's a common enemy, he said, a common problem, you know, and a common people. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, if we pull together, uh, we can fight those powers. Mm. And he did some interesting things with Radio Free Dixie. You know, he's broadcasting out of Cuba with Fidel Castro's uh, blessing. And he's got this huge um, radio tower that can broadcast for <laughs> hundreds, if not thousands of miles. Uh, but his goal is to go into the South, you know, hence Radio Free Dixie in imitation of the kinds of you know, propaganda that the United States was sending out in uh, Europe during World War II. Um, he is similarly propagandizing uh, in the American South, but sort of inverting it, right? Aiming his messages at black listeners and, and I suppose maybe uh, convertible others, but he's, he's not only playing political commentary, um, which as Dr. Parker saying, um, you know, uh, deeply political, uh, political comedy, commentary informed by revolutionary Marxist and communist ways of thought that are of course thriving in Cuba, China, uh, North Vietnam, where he also goes. Um, he's also playing blues and he's also playing jazz. He's, uh, insurrectionary art forms that are at once uh, violent, profane, uh, they're also exciting, supposed to motivate people. And he ends up um, actually motivating here in North Carolina, a couple of uh, independent radio stations spring up in the 1970s and the 1980s that are doing something very similar. WAFR in Durham, uh, which is nonprofit, non-commercial, minority-owned and operated station that's broadcasting really similar music with similar intentions. Um, early uh, hip hop music that's intended to spur people to revolution and then also broadcasting uh, political commentary and speeches. And then we also get WVSP in uh, Warren County, North Carolina, uh, a more rural space that's you know, advocating uh, issues particular uh, to that space, but also more generally music, poetry, artistic expression, the kinds of things that black audiences couldn't hear on white owned stations where they might have one hour that's set aside for the so-called colored hour. And I don't know how far the broadcast reached. It was a 50,000 watt receiver. And so there's a decent chance it reached all the way up to Canada. But one of the interesting things about those broadcasts is that they were circulated on bootleg recordings 
after they were played. And those bootlegs would be played at radio stations in New York, like WBAI or radio stations in Berkeley. And so he had, even without that massive uh, broadcast strength, the signal strength, he had a reach because he had this sort of mouth to mouth, word of mouth, geographic uh, sort of, uh, not piracy, but people were willing to, to copy and share this material in ways that really sort of anticipated you know, the music piracy of the 1990s, the bootlegging of the 1980s and the 1970s. And so he did something really, really interesting with technology at the time that was imitating how the government was using technology, but using very subversive uh, art and very subversive political messages uh, in those broadcasts. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, again, and I keep going back to this interview that I'm in love with, with Mabel Williams, and she talks about how he was an intellectual, you know, she also describes him as bashful and quite shy, but he was always reading, he was writing poetry, you know, another nice little historical uh, crossroads was he went to several HBCUs before he joined the Marines and met Langston Hughes, who was a hero of his. So this is somebody who was, she said, always listening to classical music. Um, and when you pair these things with the image that we have been presented, you know, it just doesn't add up. So I think, um, you know, it's really incredible. I will say in terms of the broadcast range, I do remember the art, an article we're going to share with you by Dr. Tim Tyson, who Seth mentioned, says the range. I just don't remember what the range was. So we'll, you'll, we'll, you'll be able to get that answer. Um, I want to ask you guys a question that, that I know is on every teacher's mind. Um, and, you know, especially given, as I mentioned, our state board just had a huge kerfuffle about our social studies standards um, when the writers tried to make it a little bit more inclusive of issues such as hard history and teaching about systemic racism and things like that. Um, so we have a lot of teachers asking the question of why does North Carolina still so strongly resist, and not just North Carolina, I'd say the nation, allowing teachers to present a more accurate history of the civil rights movement, specifically, why does today's education system in 2021 still have an issue teaching the ideals of Black resistance, Black self-defense, and the Black power movement when it is factually such an important piece of the story and frankly could be really empowering to children of all races? I know that's a really big question, but what is your opinion on that? And maybe also, is there anything we can do about that other than just every teacher on here going for broke, as James Baldwin would say, and teaching it? <laughs> you know, I think it's a fight that, that we've been fighting for well over 100 years. Mm. Um, Carter G. Woodson started the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in 1915 to deal with that, that very question. That's right. Uh, he started in, in 1916 the Journal of Negro History to get the information out there, to get, to get the scholarship out there. Uh, he started Negro History Day, uh, Black History uh, Week, and and Black History Month, I mean, in an effort to get the information out there. Um, but I think that our society has been so deeply divided and racism has been so entrenched uh, over 250 years that it's, it's very difficult to pull away from that. Mm. It, is, it is so deep in our, in our DNA that we, we refuse to do that. When we see in a glaring way that this is the history, we, we still would rather do the fake thing. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, if I, if I could really answer this question, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. I might be working somewhere else because I would be able to, to answer the question. And I really, I really can't. I don't, you, you have to get into the hards in the minds of people to really understand why it is, uh, you, you know, you still think the way you do. Mm. You know, our hope is that we continue doing what we're doing today. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is trying to get that hard history taught. Uh, I mean, uh, to uh, what the state of North Carolina is doing right now in an effort to repress the teaching of women's history you know, women have been 
the backbone of this nation. I mean, just <laughs> the civil rights movement itself. I mean, who right. were the individuals and in, who made the civil rights movement what the civil rights movement was? Black women. Who made the women? black power movement what it was? Who has made the black church what it is today? Go visit a black church this coming Sunday morning. You can't visit one. But if you were able to visit a black church a year ago, you would find that out of 200 people in there, 150 of them are women. Mm. And so, you know, when, when we look at uh, the history of this nation, uh, the entrenchment of ideas have not allowed us to go beyond, you know, dealing with the fake. Mm. And we can only hope that these kinds of sessions and and what Seth does and what I do and what you do, you know, that you, you'll continue to, to open doors. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna happen overnight, uh, but uh, you keep pressing, you keep pressing and hopefully, you know, at some point in time in 200 years, uh, we'll be there. I'm I love that though. You are speaking to the power of teachers. We know yeah. it's risky work. It's challenging work. Like I said, we're going to load everybody on the, on the Zoom up with a ton of resources, but that's the power of a teacher. And until we teach it, it's not going to change. And until it changes, we're going to keep coming. We're going to keep having a year like we just had, I think, until we face it and reconcile and repair things just can't completely heal. I think what gives me hope is we have a pre-K teacher joining us who's asking what tools should we be using to teach young children younger than five years old about these types of things. I love that question. And yes, we should be teaching young children about this, but at an age appropriate level. And rather than have Seth answer that question, I'm going to tell you um, there's a brilliant book by Michelle Lanier. We did a program on it that Paul can put in the chat, My NC from A to Z, which is a beautiful board book of Black history and culture and power um, from North Carolina. It has everybody from Abraham Galloway to Polly Murray to Ella Baker. That is an example of how you can start to get at some of this, even when we're just wee little babies, because we all know, I think, what is it, three years old, we start to see race. And so we need to start bringing that into the conversation with our young folks. Um, since we are at time, I want to close and ask both of you um, a final question. Um, there's a, a, an amazing question in the, the chat. Katie is a history teacher in Union County, Monroe. She says she's new to the area. She's excited to explore the life of Robert Williams with her students. She's wondering if there's any memorial or anything honoring him. I don't know of anything other than the reprinting of Negroes with Guns a while back. I don't know of any memorial, do you guys? I do not. Yeah, I don't think there is. So Katie, what a great project for you and your students to work exactly. on. And our lesson plan on Robert Williams that we've created, uh, Paul might wanna pop that in the chat too, actually has that as a potential closing activity. Um, but I wanna just pitch to you guys the closing question. Just a few minutes of general reflection from both of you on how you feel we should ultimately remember Robert Williams. What is his legacy? What should his legacy be? And why is it critical that teachers teach this in the K-12 classroom? I'm gonna let you guys answer that and then I'm gonna let us play out and hear Mabel Williams' answer to that. But what are your thoughts? Well, we know from uh, I mean, generations and generations of instruction um, in black cl classrooms and more recently, but still generations of instruction in, in white and integrated classrooms, that these are the kinds of stories that inspire students to collective action, uh, that inspire students to um, embracing the kinds of heroes who might not have memorials to them yet, but um, who um, certainly deserve the kind of attention and acclaim uh, that they're increasingly um, receiving. I find that in teaching a little bit about people like Robert F. Williams, um, you can introduce students to the civil rights movement in a fresh way, in a way that makes it uh, detailed and new to them, even if they've spent time in the classroom every year uh, learning about uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And I think particularly for uh, students here in North Carolina and particularly for our students from uh, smaller towns and from rural spaces are often surprised to learn 
that civil rights activism wasn't limited to marches on Washington and it wasn't necessarily limited, although Robert F. Williams did this to uh, counter sit ins and the kinds of sort of familiar images um, that were well used by protesters to break up desegregation, but that the civil rights movement was uh, a network of essential support that came from churches, that came from uh, civic groups, but also came from the long standing tradition that Dr. Parker highlighted of black people in slavery and after slavery using every means at their disposal to preserve their humanity and the humanity of their family. Thank you. I would essentially echo what uh, Seth has said. I would, would say that, um, uh, I hate to use superlatives, but uh, the man is, is one of my heroes. Uh, when you look back at, um, at Robert Williams, uh, you know, all history is local. And uh, I, I think that uh, when you look at history and microcosm, you, you can start with a man like this, a man who starts in the 1950s, but becomes an international figure within a few years. So he goes from, from microcosm to macrocosm mm -hmm. and uh, our study of, of this, this individual. I just think that, you know, in the future, when we talk about the civil rights movement, you cannot talk about, write about the civil rights movement, uh, the black power movement, the influence, a, a, an influencer on those movements without mentioning the name Robert Williams. Yes, thank you. So like I said, I'm gonna in just a minute have Mabel Williams weigh in on this question um, via one of her wonderful excerpts. But I first wanna say just a huge thank you to you, Dr. Freddie Parker, Dr. Seth Koch. Uh, you've given us so much to think about and we appreciate your thoughts on this chilly, rainy, icy in some places evening. Um, so just thank you for your time, for your insights. And let's hope that if every single person, you know, we all had all over a hundred folks can go and tell somebody about Robert Williams and teach students about Robert Williams, we'll start to move the needle a little bit, I hope. So um, I'll let you guys go off camera and mute and uh, they are going to hang out for just a little bit. We're gonna keep the chat open and the Q and A open and, um, they might be able to answer some of your lingering questions in writing because I know we had a ton. Um, I also want to say thank you to our partners at the North Carolina Museum of History, our funders at the Bright Mayer Foundation. Remember, we're going to be sending out a massive list of resources to all of you, a ready-to-go lesson plan that you can use tomorrow that uses these clips of Mabel's oral history interview and a ton of other primary sources, including the Ballad of Monroe that we opened the program with. Mostly thank you to each of you who have joined us, to you teachers who really have the power, even though it doesn't feel like it, to change this and to move the needle. Uh, as I said in the opening, I find it an absolute tragedy that Mabel, that students aren't learning about folks like Mabel and Robert Williams. And so I hope you'll leave tonight and help us change that. Um, go and, and just tell somebody and teach somebody. Um, you know, I also find it tragic that they were forced to live overseas, even while they were both, you know, spoke about and admittedly homesick due to completely trumped up charges. So years of their lives were effective all because of the way the bravery that Robert Williams exhibited in fighting back against Jim Crow and segregation and racialized violence, despite a country that didn't hold itself up to its ideals, Robert still loved this country and wanted to come back. Um, and had hope for her when he returned. And so we owe he and Mabel um, more wide, just thanks and a more widely celebrated legacy, I think. So on that note, um, we're all gonna camera off and mute, but like I said, we're gonna keep this open. If you wanna stay, we have a final five minute, incredible excerpt to play from again, the amazing Mabel Williams. Um, it is her, the same 1990 interview with historian David Soselski in which she discusses what she thinks Robert's legacy should be. So I'm going to say good night. I'm going to say Bye. thank you again, teachers. You're the glitter and the glue. Thank you for joining us. Look for all the follow-up resources, Dr. Koch, Dr. Parker, thank you. Um, again, if you guys wanna speak to us in chat or Q&A, we'll be here for about five more minutes while we listen to the amazing Mabel Williams. Thank, Thank you, you teachers. Good night. If we look at, this is a story that Robert liked to tell all the time. 
you go by a school, and it's a Martin Luther King school, and a little black child says to his mother, Mama, who was Martin Luther King? The mother replies, Martin Luther King was a civil rights man. He was a great leader of the black people. He loved his people, and he led them in a nonviolent fight, struggle. And uh, as a result of that, now we have integration and blah, blah, we. And he said, well, oh, what happened to Martin Luther King? Well, he was killed. Why was he killed? Well, he was killed because he loved his people and he struggled for his people, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, go down the road and here's a Medgar Evers University. Same scenario. Well, Mama, who was Medgar Evers? And when she explains who Medgar Evers was, well, what happened to him? Well, he was killed because he struggled for his people. He loved his people and... and uh, uh, racists killed him. They killed him. Malcolm X. Well, Mama, this is Malcolm X Boulevard. Who, who is Malcolm X? Same story. He loved his people. He struggled for his people, and he was killed. And the message that that is given to young people, young black people, is if you love your people and you struggle to raise their level, you will be killed. So what young person is going to want to become a Malcolm X, a um, Martin Luther King, or Mega Evers, or any of those martyrs that now we got Martin Luther King holiday, you know? Who's going to want to pattern themselves after those people? Not anybody. No... And, and now you look out there, who's leading? Who's leading, you know? What kind of leadership do you have? Who wants to step in those footsteps? Nobody. But then you've got a Robert F. Williams, who, as he liked to say, went home to Mount Vernon <laughs> <laughs> and lived out his days as a gentleman, well, like the, the president went home to Mount Vernon and lived out his days as right. a gentleman. Right. Um, surrounded by his family. Yes, surrounded by his family and loved ones and so forth and so on. Had a long and life. Had a long life, a long, fruitful life. Loved his people, struggled for his people, fought for his people, not only nationally, not only in North Carolina, not only in Monroe, let's say, not only in North Carolina, not only in the United States, but all over the world, went all over the world and continued to struggle for his people and then went home to become a gentleman farmer, <laughs> you know. So, hey, maybe, maybe this is the kind, that's the kind of example that should be out there in front of not only black children, but white children as well. Hey, if you take the side of the people and you struggle for the best interest of the people and the side of good and, the side of good and hook, your, hook yourself to that star, then your life is, is worthwhile. And that's the legacy that I would like to see for the Robert F. Williams story. That's the legacy that I'd like to see. Yes, yes, yeah. way beyond because that. Because it's a, it's a, um, um, that, I mean, guns do capture a young person's imagination. Yes, yes, in yes, In a yes. way that, that mm -hmm. uh, having uh, a milkshake poured in your head yeah. at a lunch counter does not. Right, of course. But, um, but it's something else. It's, uh, um, don't you think like that when a, you know, when a child, Mm-hmm. 
But it's not necessarily just that it's not that they're what that they're willing to use violence. Yes. But one sees something more mm-hmm. behind that. And what what do you think someone was gonna see? What what was behind behind the behind the shotgun? Uh huh. I think they they would see a person who really knows that one person can make a difference. One person standing up can definitely make a difference in not only his life, but in the lives of other people. And that that one person, Rob believed that we all had that responsibility, that everybody's born for something Everybody um, is here for a purpose. You have to choose sides. There, there are forces out here that are forces for good, and there are forces out here for evil. And there comes a time in your life that you have to make a choice. And once you make that choice and you choose a side of good, then it just opens up a whole new world for you. You can be tolerant of people's prejudices, because you understand that they're coming from, you know, where they're coming from, that those, what made them that way. But then you can appeal to their better side and hope and pray that they will choose as well to support the good forces in this world and become a part of this big family that we, I feel we are, those of us who have chosen the side of good, are really a big family, and we are a world family, and there's no race, racism in that family. There are races in that family, and there are people who prefer to be with their people, and that's fine. But there is a respect for each other and a respect for each other's beliefs, and so...